This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks a lot, uh, Bill, for this uh, very nice and kind uh, introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and also to have the opportunity to talk twice to, uh, to the audience uh, here. And I see some faces that uh, see, will see both presentations and they are quite different. Although I have to apologize for all the horticulturists here in the, in the audience. I'm a molecular biologist and I will do my best to hook up the things we do to uh, physiologically physiological uh, aspects, uh, morphological aspects, but there will be quite some molecular biology in it. So I hope you can follow it or that you can afterwards catch up again when we go back to a slightly different topic. So yeah, um, flowering time research uh, in Tulip and uh, as Bill nicely indicated, um, the Dutch Growers Association, Koninklijke Algemene Vereniging voor Bloembollenkultuur, they are financing a lot and, and nowadays also Stima Flori um, is financing part of my uh, research. So I think this you are all aware of, uh, the Netherlands is the country of, uh, of tulips, although they do not originate from Holland, they come from, from Turkey, Iran, that's the region where originally tulip is, is growing and, and native from, but already from, from many years, uh, tulips are very popular in the Netherlands and in the 16th century, tulips were even used as a uh, way of currency. So they had a very high value and people paid with tulip bulbs uh, their bills. Well, that completely collapsed and it was also the very first um, financial uh, disaster, uh, I think, on the, uh, on the stock market. Um, but then still tulips are, are important products for the Netherlands. And while well, the Keukenhof, that is our tulip and, and uh, bulbous plant um, uh, ornamental garden, it's only open for one or two months a year, but it's getting more visitors than, for example, the Kew Botanical Gardens in the UK, which are very popular. So in that respect, uh, we are really a tulip country. Well, then you would maybe also think there is a lot of research ongoing in Tulip and well, unfortunately in the past there was a lot of physiological research, but nowadays that really drops and we are very happy that uh, Bill is still uh, very active in that. But if you see in the Netherlands, it's quite disappointing uh, the amount of, of, of efforts that are put into fundamental and applied research in, in bulbous plant research. So what I will do today is uh, I will give you a very short outline how I came uh, involved in, uh, in Tulip uh, research. Uh, then um, I will talk on, on different aspects, so flower induction by spring temperatures. So again, temperature is an important uh, aspect. Dormancy control in tulip by winter cold. Uh, then shortly uh, a part on vegetative reproduction and very short what we hope to do in the near uh, future. So first a little bit of, of history. Um, at 2010 this Royal Botanical uh, society uh, had its 100 years anniversary and then they say to the Dutch um, a government of agriculture and economical affairs, we would like to get a kind of present for our birthday. And they said, well, there's hardly any research ongoing. We would like to install a professor, especially on, on bulbous plant research for one day in a week. And then that professor can set up a small team with two PhDs. And they got that money. And then it was an, um, uh, it, it took quite long to set it all up. And in 2012, uh, you could apply for that position. And well, Bill made the, the very nice joke this morning. I said, well, I, I had not worked before uh, with tulips. And the title of it was Physiology of Flower Bulbs of this special tier. I was not a physiologist, a molecular biologist. So Bill directly said, if you want somebody that has no knowledge on tulips, not on physiology, you are the guy to get the job. And they selected me somehow. So, <laughs> and the reason for that is that, um, has to do with the topics they selected, the research topics. Because um, at the start of this um, special chair, they said there are two topics we would like you to work on, and that's flowering time control, so one PhD student studying that topic, and a second one, the regulation of vegetative propagation in tulip. And also they said, well, we preferably we would like you to work on tulip and not on other bulbous species. So it was a really focused research program. And my, my background is, is especially in flowering time research. And that's why they said, well, maybe you are the correct candidate to do this research. And also to get somebody who has a complete different view on yeah, what, what should maybe be done and what we can learn from, from tulip research. So that's how it started. So as I indicated already, I'm not a physiologist, so it will be more molecular biology of flower bulbs. Uh, sorry for that, but uh, that's just because that was my experience. And it was also the approach uh, we followed. So yeah, then the question is how to start. As I indicated, my knowledge in, in tulips was not that big. I'm a molecular biologist. So, um, and up to then, mainly physiological research was done. Good quality physiological research, but 
there was a clear cut lack on, on basic information. Like there is no genome sequence of tulip. Um, there are hardly any papers out with a molecular approach, uh, proteomics, transcriptomics. There was really nothing when we started to work on, uh, on tulip. So yeah, one thing you can think, no, let's go and sequence the genome, but well, that's quite challenging because tulip is, in comparison to Arabidopsis, it's huge. It's just, the genome is even much bigger than our own genome. 25 gigabase pairs, and I directly said, well, that is something I'm not going to do. But what then? And uh, then we said, well, uh, maybe it's more interesting to look to the active part of the, of the genome as a start and, and start using transcriptomics. And that's what we did. We initially said, well, let's set up a kind of basic uh, platform for uh, what, what people can also start using. And what we did is we selected uh, at three different time points during the growth cycle of, a, of an adult tulip. We selected material, so uh, uh, January, March, and May in the, in the growth season, and then we took five tissues, scales, axillary buds, leaves, stem, and flower from one cultivar, dynasty, and we said, let's do an RNA-seq on that so that we get sequence information available. Well, that's what we did. At that moment, we also decided to do a similar approach for Lily, and uh, I will show later on why we were also interested in, in Lily. So uh, what we did then is we, we did the sequencing, but then we said, well, to make it available for the, uh, for the scientific community, it would also be nice if somehow there is a kind of, well, tier, uh, the Arbidopsis information resource for, for tulips. It's by far not like that, but at least that people can, can do simple searches like a blast search to find their uh, sequences. So at that moment, I asked my bioinformatician to set up a website, and it's still online. If one of you wants to use it, then you get a, uh, an error, please directly send me an email because once in a while they reset the server and then it's not working and only if somebody is telling me then I will realize or if one of my own students uh, is using it. But we will try to keep this uh, online and then people can search for their favorite uh, sequences. So back to, um, to the topic. So flower induction in tulip because that was the biological project we, we worked on. And well, if you go to the annual growth cycle of, uh, of tulip, and I think that's known by a lot of people if you have a full grown tulip, in, in the Netherlands it's planted in autumn, in late autumn, already almost winter. So end of October, beginning of November, then a bulb is planted. And the very first thing that works and, and happens then is, is rooting. So you get uh, rooting of the tulip bulbs. And the most important is you need the winter cold to release the tulip from dormancy. So this tulip, it is rooting, but then for a long, quite a long period, you hardly see anything happening from the outside. And only after sufficient winter cold, you get this very fast shooting, which then with this fast stem elongation leads in spring to full blooming. And exactly at that moment, also the new cycle is started because you get the, the, the whole mother bulb is, is consumed, but in that mother bulb, you get daughter bulbs formed. And in the main daughter bulb, at that moment, you get induction of flowering. So a lot of people think that tulip is a fertilization responsive plant because it needs winter cold before you see the flower. But actually what winter cold is doing is breaking dormancy. So that's quite different from uh, fertilization. And it's the warm temperatures in summer that induce uh, flowering in the bud. But then shortly after, after it's induced, that bud becomes dormant. And then you need, again, you restart the cycle. You need the winter cold to break that uh, dormancy. So the first part of my talk will uh, focus on the effect of this warm temperatures in spring, um, beginning of summer, end of spring, on the induction of uh, flowering. Well, as I said, uh, in the past, quite some research was done. And already in the, in the 50s of the last uh, century, people have been looking to, to the switch of flowering and how at the meristem level inside the bulb, the shoot apical meristem, how that is changing over time. And then you see very nicely in the beginning, it's, it's a flat meristem with, this is a leaf uh, primordium. And the very first thing that you can see when a bulb starts to flower is that you get swelling of the central meristem. And then shortly after, you see that, uh, here you see the sepals, or which are called tepals in, uh, in tulip, arising. And very fast, you see all the different floral organs coming. Here you see the stamens, the pistil in the middle. And then this is what's called the G stage. That's more or less the stage that it arrests and, and, and becomes dormant. So this was already nicely described, and that we used as a reference to, to study the flowering process. And then in the end, what you have is you have, when you cut open a bulb, and in the inside you have a complete flower there, but it's dormant. 
So what we did then, and we thought, well, how, how to do this? Because I was used to Arabidopsis, that you can nicely grow in, in growth chambers and, and play around with temperature and all kinds of things. But growing tulip in growth chambers, that is uh, still, it is possible and, and you can do it. So you can grow it hydroponically. But we thought, let's go to the natural system. But if you want, then uh, we know that, that it's ambient temperature that is affecting flowering. But yeah, if you plant them outside, you never know, will it be a hot year, a cold year? And how to then get a contrasting system where only the temperature is different and then you can see well in, in high temperature is inducing flowering and a low temperature not so we came then to the idea to plant tulips in crates so we put them in these crates and then these crates were buried in the soil and for the first part of the whole growth season we left these crates in the field until the moment that they were nicely flowering and then shortly after that so then the, the new cycle should start and in the daughter bulbs that are then growing you get the induction. We placed these crates in the growth chambers with either nine degrees, so keeping the cold temperature that you have around that time of the year, or 18 degrees, you get a fast induction of flowering. Well, normally in the flower induction process, somewhere in between that process, the bulbs get harvested and they uh, are put in storage and then switch to flowering depending on the temperature uh, in that spring is happening slightly before that or afterwards in storage. So initially they are stored around 20 degrees Celsius. But we said, well, if we are going to harvest them in between, that will have a lot of effect because you damage, you, you take the roots off, uh, you dry the bulb. So we said, let's, let's keep them in this crate until the moment of, that we see that the meristem switches. So that's what we, what we looked at. So the bulbs were grown in the fields. Uh, we transferred them to the controlled temperature conditions. We did this morphological characterization. And then, based on that morphological characterization, we decided to do an RNA-seq. So to see which genes, genome-wide, gets activated by the heat or repressed by the heat and not by the cold temperature. And those are then potentially involved in the floral induction. And uh, for that, uh, we isolated some candidates and then preferably you would like to confirm their functioning in tulip. The tulip is difficult to transform, so what we did in the end, we took the genes from tulip and we did a functional characterization heterologously in Arabidopsis. So the morphological characterization, as I mentioned already in the 50s, they figured out that uh, this meristem that you have, the shoot apical meristem, initially when these daughter bulbs are formed, that's flat, and you see only a leaf primordium there. So here you have the basal plate, and here that's where the meristem is. And from the moment on that we place these uh, crates, either at cold temperature or warm temperature, the very first five weeks, we didn't notice any difference between the two temperatures. The meristem remained flat, the leaf primordial remained there. It, it grew a little bit, but that was it. So we didn't saw in the very first five weeks any sign of floral induction. But the nice thing came around week six, week seven. Then at the cold temperature, you see that it, it keeps on staying very similar. So you have, again, still that flat meristem. You have the leaf primordia, so a little bit depending on, on how you make the preparation and from which side you, you picture it. But not a lot is happening. Even after 10 weeks, still it's vegetative. But at the warm temperature from week six, you see the swelling. Week seven, you can see this very clearly. And then in a very short time, one, two weeks time, you get a complete floral bud there. So we had a nice system where we have induction of flowering here at the warm temperature and no induction there. And that is the material that we used for the RNA seq. But of course, this is visually and flowering is controlled. The, the whole activation of flowering must be far before this moment. So then we said, let's, let's see also if we can get a little bit more information what is ongoing molecularly. And for that, we went to, uh, to Arabidopsis and, and Antarinum because there is one gene, it's called squamosa or APETLA1 in Arabidopsis. That is a black and white gene making the difference between the vegetative states and the reproductive states. So it's completely off in the vegetative states, but as soon as a plant starts flowering, it's the floral meristem identity gene. You see this gene coming high up. And what you can see here very nicely when we check by qPCR, the expression of that gene in the warm temperature from week six onwards, and once you see it very steeply going up, whereas in the cold temperature and even week 10, it's not shown here, it remains off. It's also showing molecularly, yes, uh, there is something ongoing from week six. Well, as I indicated, we are interested in, in floral induction, so we decided not to look too much here, but we decided to look especially from this moment on Till this moment because if you are interested in the genes that trigger flowering you should look what is happening before that moment of switching on the floral meristem identity gene. 
So here you see uh, an overview of that. So what you see, this is a principal component analysis. We just selected uh, zero weeks, two weeks, three, four, five, six, up to seven. And uh, we did an, um, uh, an RNA-seq on that. And here you see just the overall expression differences. And then what you can see very nicely that all these green, bluish colors, they are from the cold temperature. You see that in the cold temperature, although it's a seven weeks period, you hardly see anything happening. You also see that the initial samples from the warm temperature are in between here, that are these yellow ones uh, over here. But then in the warm, if you go uh, already two and a half weeks after the start of this experiment, when you don't see anything on the activation, you see already that you get a big shift in the transcriptome. And especially around week three, four, there are huge differences. Then for a while it stays quite similar. And then week six, seven, you see again a huge difference. Well, these are actually all the floral organ identity genes that get switched on. So that gives us an idea on what is ongoing. And you can also see already that molecularly, although morphologically you see something from week six, seven onwards, molecularly already from the very first moment onwards, you see a very clear cut effect on the transcriptome. Well, then, of course, the question is, what are that kind of genes? And for that, we used uh, so-called gene ontology analysis, and we look to over-representation, because still it are thousands of genes that are differentially expressed. And, well, the problem is there is no tulip genome, so you have to somehow link um, a putative function to these uh, genes. So based on the annotation in Arabidopsis and sequence homology and the annotation in RISE, we hooked up a putative function to all these genes, and then we look for overrepresented terms. And again, what you see, it's uh, week 2.5 up to 7, and it's always a comparison to time point zero, and these are the upregulated genes, and these are the downregulated genes. Well, there's a lot of information on it, but we will focus on a, on a very few. Cell cycle, that's an interesting one, and you see that's really high at week 6, uh, increased, and that's the moment that you see is swelling. So a lot of this swelling that you see is probably cell elongation, but this enlargement of the meristem is also a lot of cell division probably. So at the moment of switching, you get a boost of cell division and that makes it you get an enlarged meristem. Well, not surprisingly, vegetative to reproductive phase transition, genes known to be involved in that, you see them very nicely gradually going up. Already two and a half weeks after the induction in heat, they come up and they peak at six weeks and then they go down. So this is not so surprising me. But I want to warn you, um, you are interested in flowering and then you think, oh, every gene that is going up has to do something with flowering or every gene that is going down. But that is, of course, not the case. You always should go back and think what is more happening to these tulips? Because at the same moment, uh, other things are happening. And, and I will tell you that one later. And what we notice is there are a lot of genes, dormancy process, seed maturation, response to abscisic acid. And initially thought, hey, a tulip bulb is not a seed, but if you think it's a reproductive structure that is shortly after drying, and what we noticed is that the program that is activated, you get a, this tulip that uh, overwinters, and uh, is, is similar as the program that is activated in seeds to get a dormant seed, and that a seed can overwinter and germinate the next spring. So a lot of genes that are in seed maturation, response to abscisic acid, and dormancy, you find them nicely getting upregulated, probably having nothing to do with the induction of flowering, but by preparing the bulb for this dormant period and uh, over winter. Well, one thing that I forgot, that was the RNA splicing. Um, those who were there on Friday uh, heard from me that um, temperature, especially these ambient temperatures, which is inducing flowering, they act a lot at the splicing level. And I was very surprised and also happy to see that also here RNA splicing is one of the major uh, components, but we didn't dive into it because there is not a good annotate a transcriptome and genome, and then it's very difficult to get hand on all these different isoforms that are there. But it seems that also in tulip, uh, maybe part of this uh, regulation of floral induction is happening at the splicing uh, level. Well, linked to all the seed terms that are activated, you see that at the same moment, because what this bulb does, it's preparing for dormancy, you see that all in the downregulated, it's mainly metabolic processes that gets downregulated. So you see very nicely that at the same moment that flowering is induced, the whole bulb is preparing for a long silent period and low uh, metabolic activity. Richard, are, are these, what tissues were these from? Oh yeah, sorry that I didn't uh, mention that. Um, all this is uh, isolated from, uh, from the shoot apical meristem. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's only uh, shoot apical meristem material. Oh. 
Well, then uh, a focus on some genes. Uh, again, it's based on Arabidopsis with the annotations, but a well-known repressor of flowering in Arabidopsis is uh, called terminal flower. It's in the same family as FT, the Florigen, but it's an, you can see it as an anti-Florigen. And what we very nicely see is that that gene, as soon as you place tulips in the warmth, its expression is going down, whereas in the cold, very gradually it goes down, but it takes, well, six, seven, eight weeks longer before it's completely down. So suggesting that the functionality of this gene is very conserved and that terminal flower is an active repressor of flowering in, in tulips. Um, something similar you see for a SOC1-like gene, and that's remarkable because SOC1 is known as an activator of flowering. And this SOC1-like gene seems also to be a repressor because in the warmth it's going down and in the heat it's going up. And this is also showing directly how difficult it is to work then with another species because we also found a SOC-like gene that acts as SOC1 in Arabidopsis that is going in the heat, it's going up. So this SOC is probably an activator and this SOC, based on expression, you would expect it's a repressor of flowering. So at this moment we are following up these two uh, copies of SOC1 to figure out exactly what they are doing and if they maybe counteract each other and that the balance between these two copies is determining the moment of, uh, of flowering. Well, that's, that's all nice uh, if you see that then, and then you can think, well, we identified the genes, but if you want, in the end, you want the final confirmation, because uh, maybe you can recall that how we did this experiment, we were planting these bulbs in, in crates, we took them up and put them at continuous cold or continuous warm temperature, we were also not harvesting them, uh, we left them in the crates till the moment of flowering. That's quite different from how it normally goes in the field. So we said, well, maybe we should redo this experiment, and that we did two years uh, later but then leave the bulbs in the ground, uh, in the field as normal, um, dig them up, um, store them in the in normal storage, and then see what's ongoing. And that's what we did. So we repeated the experiment, and then we also decided to include different cultivars that have quite different moment of blooming in spring. So strong gold, for example, a very late uh, flower, yellow flight even later, whereas purple prince is a very early variety. Where you see, um, uh, this is in April, fourth month. We always turn that around in the Netherlands somehow in comparison to how you are doing that. So it's all in April and you see very nicely that, uh, that there's quite a big difference, sometimes even three weeks before you see blooming. Well, what it's good to realize is that um, what we are looking at is, is flower induction. And that is something different from blooming because the moment of blooming does not only depend on the moment that a flowering is induced, but it also depends on how much dormancy does the tulip have? And there came one interesting thing because Stronghold here is a very late cultivar and that would mean that uh, genes like terminal flower would be repressed later. But if you look to the switch, Stronghold is the earliest. So yellow means uh, uh, reproductive and green vegetative. If you compare purple prints, which is much earlier blooming in spring, to Stronghold, which is a very late one, you see that Stronghold, when you look to the switch of the meristem, it's the opposite. So Stronghold is a very, heat is very efficiently switching the meristem to flowering, whereas in Purple Prince, it's much later. So that's showing that the difference in flowering time in the spring is not determined by the difference in the moment of switching, but mainly by how, how much dormancy does a particular tulip cultivar uh, have. That also means that we didn't uh, use in the end this flowering time, this blooming time to um, asso put association, but we associated it, we, we looked again to the meristems of this material, and we associated the expression of the genes with this switch. And then what you can see very nicely, this terminal flower um, gene, that when you compare uh, strong gold with purple prints, you see that in strong gold, uh, which is about two to three weeks earlier making the switch, also terminal flower is going about three to two weeks earlier down. So there's a very nice correlation between the expression of genes like terminal flower with uh, the moment they make the switch of the meristem, but not with the moment they are blooming the next year, because that is, is linked to the dormancy cycle. Well, that are all still correlations. At least it's also in the natural situation. We showed that the same genes, and I showed you only terminal flower, but the same was the case for socks, squamosa, so all these genes that we identified. So it was, was very robust. But are, are these genes really repressors of flowering? So to study that a little bit more, what we did is we took the tulip terminal flower gene and we introduced it into Arabidopsis and then scored for flowering time. And then, yes, indeed, when you overexpress the tulip 
terminal flower gene in Arabidopsis, indeed you get a much later flowering, also confirming that this protein has a flowering repressing uh, capacity. Well, uh, Bill already reminded me that I should say something on the tissue that I uh, isolated, that were meristems, and, and maybe one thing is coming up with you, if you know a little bit on flowering time research, where is Florigen? Because I didn't talk about Florigen yet, and you would expect that in the heat, Florigen goes up, and that that is then triggering flowering. And I didn't talk about Florigen, does tulip maybe not have Florigen? Well, it has, but then you have to realize where Florigen in most cases is expressed, that is, for example, in Arabidopsis, it's not expressed at all in the shoot apical meristem, but it's expressed in the leaves and moving from there a signal to the shoot apical meristem. So we sampled only shoot apical meristem material, and that was maybe the reason that we didn't found the true Florigen uh, homolog from Tulip. So to uh, go back then to our uh, database, because we said there must be a Florigen, so we went back to our database and we looked in there, can we find FT members that are maybe having this, this Florigen function? And we found, so there is, as I indicated, terminal flower also belongs to the, to the Florigen uh, uh, clade, to the FT uh, family. It's a repressor of flowering and it very nicely groups together with the Arabidopsis terminal flower, um, uh, the terminal flower from barley, uh, from, um, from rice. So you see it's very conserved, the functioning of this family. From dicots to monocots, you see that the repressors are in the same subclade. And then we also found two FT likes, FT like one uh, at two, FT1 and FT2, which are in the same subplate as the Arabidopsis FT and twin sister of FT, so activators of flowering. And this suggests that these are then the true Florigens of tulip. There's also a very interesting one here, TGFT3, because it's in this clade, and well, if you know the abbreviations, you will maybe see that AC, that's um, uh, onion. Actually, in this subclade, there are only bulbous plant species, making it very interesting. It seems to be an FT clade that is bulbous specific, and at the moment we are following that up, what is then the function of these uh, family members. So two FT-like genes, and uh, well, again, uh, and, and we have this FT3, and uh, it's a big question what that is one is doing, because it's bulbous specific, so there is no Arabidopsis uh, autolog of that one, so we cannot learn anything there from Arabidopsis. But again, what we did is, well, to, to prove that they are maybe um, involved in that, we first looked to the expression, and then you see that FT1 very nicely comes up around May in, in leaves, stem, and also in the flower. FT2, which is the supposed uh, flowering together with FT1, uh, inducing one, the Florigen, also around April, May. But also FT3, which is in that strange bulbous-specific clade, has a very similar expression pattern coming up mainly leaves and stem around April and May. So looking to this expression, we could not distinguish is FT1, FT2, or maybe this bulbous specific FT3, the real uh, Florigen. So what we did there is, again, we went to Arabidopsis, and I know that doing this heterologous studies is not ideal, but that was the best we could do. So we ectopically expressed these genes in Arabidopsis, and we hoped that one of them would give floral induction. Well, the funny thing was when we ectopically expressed FT1, which is in the same clade as the Arabidopsis florigen, we got a slight delay of flowering. It's not much, but it's a significant uh, difference. We get a late flowering plant. FT2, which is in the same clade, that seems to be the real florigen, because, well, you can see here, after producing only a very few leaves, you get flowering. So FT2 seems to be the real florigen of, of tulip. And FT3, that is the one, the bulbous specific one, also that, there is a significant effect. It makes the Arabidopsis flowering slightly later, but it can be that that is completely different from the function in tulip because this type of gene is not present in Arabidopsis normally. So to conclude this part, um, based on what we have seen now is that uh, high temperature is definitely the trigger for floral induction in, uh, in tulip. What it does, probably in the leaves, it activates already early in April. So very at the moment that uh, the mother plant is still flowering, it activates genes like FT2, so the real Florigen, which can give a positive boost to the meristem. And slightly later, uh, but far before you see flowering, it represses genes like TG terminal flower one and TG shock one. As a consequence of this repressing, this repressing factor on floral meristem identity genes is going down. You see also that the shock one like uh, gene is activated, the, the positive one, and this then gives the switch and you get a floral meristem um, produced around uh, uh, July. Uh, late June in the new daughter bulb, and you get activation very shortly after of all the floral organ identity genes. So this is our current uh, working model, and 
yeah, what we hope to do is in the new projects to get more insight in what are these different FTs doing and can we then somehow for at least for the breeding industry um, get a way to get around this uh, signaling and boost flowering already very fast in tulips so that they can much more efficiently cross tulips and, and, and back cross tulips and not need 20, 30, generation, uh, 20, 30 years to, to get new uh, traits um, bred into tulip. So the second topic, uh, dormancy control in, uh, in tulip. And well, that's all about this part, the regulation of dormancy. So I said already, it's actually tulip is not a fertilization responsive plant. It needs uh, warm temperatures to induce flowering as you've just seen. But after that, uh, at the same moment, what heat is also inducing is a dormancy program, the same as you have in seed dormancy. And you need the winter cold to reduce that dormancy and to get full blooming in spring and fast stem elongation. And as you see nice in this example, here you see uh, strong gold. Um, this is uh, from one of these um, flower shows where they show this very nice uh, long elongated uh, strong gold, which obtains sufficient cold. But if you don't give strong gold cold, you get something like this. Actually, it was uh, done at, um, at the house of the grandmother of the PhD. She, uh, she kept this plant for us, always a night atmosphere. Old people have a warm house, so they were continuously above 20 degrees. And then you see that you get some flowers, but they are hardly uh, elongating and the flowers also stay closed. They not open up, showing that you really need cold. And besides strong gold, we did a lot of other cultivars and some cultivars um, sometimes even completely degenerate. If you don't give them cold, the whole bulb disappears or the floral bud completely disappears. So cold is definitely needed as a next step in the life cycle. So once more, um, we, we were interested in what is occurring during the winter period. And uh, so what we did is we did again um, a detailed morphological analysis in time. So we looked to the, the growth and the length of the, the floral meristem and the, the stem inside. We did a physiological uh, analysis. We were measuring carbohydrates, um, on the Dionex, but also primary uh, metabolites. And we did again a transcriptional analysis to figure out what is now exactly ongoing inside such a bulb at the moment it gets released from, from dormancy by cold. Well, first something on the growth. Uh, one thing that we, that we realized, because what is dormancy? And there's always a lot of discussion on, ongoing, what is now real? Are tissues really uh, in rest or not? And, Maybe they are uh, visibly in rest, but uh, maybe molecularly a lot of things are ongoing. So we were really surprised or, or, or really curious what is now happen happening in, uh, in a tulip bulb. And one thing what we notice is if, that we, if we measure the complete shoot that is inside the tulip bulb, here yeah, from Stronghold and Dynasty, from really from the basal plate to the tip, and you look over time, so this is minus 10, that means 10 weeks before planting. Week zero is the moment of planting, and then you see the initial winter months and then in the spring. Well, definitely you can see that at a certain moment you get a boost of, of, of stretching that is after the, the dormancy is gone. But if you look to the shoot as a whole, there's not any moment that it's completely not growing. So, well, you could say there is no dormancy at all because there is maybe a growth retardation, but the shoot as a whole keeps on growing. Well, that's the shoot as a whole. What we also did, we measured only the floral bud part. And then there's a very nice thing which you can see both in Dynasty and Stronghold. In Dynasty is a little bit shorter than in Stronghold. There is a period where there is no significant growth of the bud. And then you can think, well, what does that matter? But it, what it shows is that maybe you can compare a tulip in this respect to, for example, trees which have bud dormancy. So it's not the complete structure that is dormant. The stem keeps on elongating a little bit, but it's especially the floral bud that for a well, period sometimes of, of in the case of strong gold for, um, for about two months is completely not growing. Once more, this is growth. That does not mean that molecularly nothing is happening, but at least in growth, you can say, well, uh, there is bud dormancy. So the bud is completely not, not elongating. Well, why is that? Well, it's very well known that the tulip bulbs, like also seeds, they have also, uh, they are a storage organ and there is a lot of starch in the, in the tulip bulb, but that's not um, available sugar, of course, for growth. It needs to be degraded and, and broken down into soluble sugars before the plant can grow. So what we did is we, we measured here the expression of alpha amylase. So that's the enzyme that is breaking down starch. And then what you can very nicely see that um, when you compare Dynasty with Stronghold, that soon this is the cold period, um, week zero planting, that as soon you plant them directly in Dynasty, alpha amylase goes up, it stays up quite long and then 
it's, it's really fast going up and then it drops. Whereas in Stronghold, you see that it takes a little bit longer to get up, but then it keeps on going. And this reflects very nicely also the behavior because I just showed you that although Stronghold is a fast switcher, it's a late flowering one. So that's also what you see. It takes Stronghold longer to activate alpha amylase, but then if it's up, and that's why it's maybe also such a strong cultivar, it very efficiently keeps on expressing alpha amylase and probably really efficiently breaking down all the starch, whereas Dynasty is faster, and that's maybe also why it's blooming faster in spring, but it's a little bit less efficient in taking all the starch down. Well, then we thought, well, but that's alpha amylase, I call it here activity, but it's expression. Um, is the expression reflecting the enzyme activity? Because there are many enzymes that are not regulated at the expression level. So we compared alpha amylase activity, which is the expression, with the amounts of glucose, fructose, and sucrose. And then you can very nicely see that there is a nice correlation between the expression level of alpha amylase and the amounts of soluble sucrose available in the, in the tulip. And if you compare then that to the growth of the floral stem and the floral bud and the leaves, you see that there is a perfect correlation between the amount of glucose that you can measure in the bulbs and the growth. So there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the amount of available soluble sugars and the growth capacity of the, of the tissue. Well, then about uh, transcripts, and um, what we did is we did again a global gene expression response during the winter period. And what we did there is we compared in this graph the number of transcripts that are significantly altered uh, in comparison to four weeks prior to planting. So that was our first time point. So we started sampling already during the storage, and then within the storage, so time point zero is just before planting, so it's still storage, so the bulbs are not moved or whatever or planted. That's time point zero. And um, then this is two weeks after planting, 10 weeks after planting, when you really see this boost of growth, and 12 weeks after planting. Well, and if you look then in the scales, uh, these are transcripts that are differential but going up in comparison to four weeks in the, um, in the storage or four weeks before planting. And these are transcripts going down. But anyway, you can see that you see gradually more activity in the bulb when you go from week zero to week 10, very nicely showing this, this dormancy response that. And, and the glucose and, and the growth. So uh, with the activity also in, in the scales, uh, the, the activity of the genes is going up. And especially at the moment, the dormancy is fully released. You have a lot of activity, also a lot of genes that gets downregulated. So a complete new transcriptic, transcriptional program is, uh, is coming up. When we were looking to the floral bud, we were quite surprised because um, I just told you the floral bud is not doing a lot um, during the, the, the period. It's, it's really kind of bud dormancy. That you also see back in the, when you compare week two, six, eight, twelve, you see that transcriptionally not a lot is happening in the bud. But something that we completely didn't expect is that during the last weeks in the storage, so from minus four to zero, the floral bud is the most active transcriptionally. So we think that that bud is dormant and you don't see any growth happening, but transcriptionally, somehow, this bud knows that winter will come and is preparing already itself for the next generation. And I think that's very good to keep in mind. There's a big difference between what you see on the outside and what is internal happening. That probably also means that this is maybe developmentally regulated because nothing is changing. It's just in storage at the same temperature, but still you see a lot of transcriptionally ongoing. So probably it's the age of the bulb or whatever that is measuring that and already telling, well, you have to prepare because a new season, a new period will, will arrive. Well, uh, we are still busy with going in depth in it, but here you see a gene ontology analysis, in this case of the floral bud, uh, comparing week minus four and 12. That is the moment that the buds again gets active. And then you can very nicely see that things, that's also for a long time it was silent, but starts metabolic uh, process, growth, cell differentiation, floral whorl, further development of the floral whorls, transport is activated. So you can very nicely see when you compare storage when it's very dormant in growth. And, and finally, after the, the dormancy period, you see all these processes that you expect coming up. But what is, of course, more interesting is what is happening during those first stages. And we are still digging further into that um, at this moment. Um, this is in the leaves. And there is, an, an, again, another uh, interesting aspect. Because when you compare week 0 to week 12, it's just at the moment they, become, uh, they release uh, dormancy. Of course, in the leaves, you see things like response to carbohydrate stimulus, response to temperature stimulus. This is what you expect. But one thing that we were not expecting, because as soon as a leaf comes above ground, it needs to start photosynthesizing. And then you can think, 
at least that was my naive way of thinking, maybe it's the light that is activating the photosynthesis apparatus. But a very funny thing was that we see that the genes involved in photosynthesis and light reaction are already activated before the leaf comes above the ground. So at week 12, the bulb is still on the ground, so it has not seen any light. The, the shoot is also wide. And then already you see that the whole photosynthetic apparatus is set up, meaning that that is not triggered by the environment probably, but again, that that is a developmentally triggered um, trait. So somehow this plant knows soon I will come above the ground and it's better that I already prepare for that and set up my photosynthesis uh, system. Well, then about the metabolomics uh, analysis, um, also that we did, we did it for the scales, floral bud, we also did it for the stem, but I only show here the PCAs of the, of the scale and the floral bud. Um, this is the PCA plot, what you can nicely see is you, you see a clear cut switch when you go from zero to four, not that much is happening in the scale, but then you get a clear cut switch when you go to the later time points, and especially at the moment the dormancy is released, so around week uh, 14, 12 or 14 you see again that there is a big change when you go compared to time point zero. Floral bud, you see initially that they are a uh, little bit mixed up uh, here and you have to realize it's a principal component and you see that there are zeros here and here, these are the replicates. So not that much is happening and only during the last time point you see metabolically a lot is, uh, is ongoing. And here you see just some examples, uh, glutamine, aspergine, proline, phenylalanine, silos, mannose. We are currently in the status of looking more into that, what is now exactly ongoing at the, at the metabolite um, uh, regulation. And what is even more important, we try to link that to what is happening at the transcriptome uh, level, because we have from the same time points also the transcriptomic data from the different tissues. So at the moment, um, a statistician and a bioinformatician are busy to integrate these two uh, data sets. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, say more about that uh, at this uh, moment, because simply we haven't done uh, all the analysis yet. So to summarize this part, uh, glucose levels are actually perfectly correlated with, with growth capacity of the different organs in the tulip and, and very nice way of measuring how far uh, the tulip is in its dormancy uh, cycle. And uh, another remarkable thing was that, that leaves are preparing for photosynthesis to become the new energy source of carbohydrates already before the plant emerges above ground. So this seems to be developmentally regulated. And what was also interesting to see is that although tissue seems to be dormant, at the transcriptional level, we found a surprise that the floral bud during the last period of storage is very, very active and already preparing for, for the next step. Um, so far about flowering and yeah, um, um, so I will uh, show a few things on, on vegetative reproduction and probably I see that uh, otherwise I go over time, I cannot show everything. This part is also shorter, but I would like to show you something on because at the moment that the tulip is inducing flowering, it is also going into vegetative reproduction, daughter bulb formation. And there the question is, uh, at least for growers, what is the reason that tulips make actually so little daughter bulbs? Um, in, in general, there are three daughter bulbs that have the size to give again a flowering bulb in the next generation. And also, if you look to these daughter bulbs, there are three that have a normal size, but there are also these small ones that don't grow out at all. And why is that not equally distributed? Well, for that you first have to look again in, in how is this developing and um, if you look very early in the bud, um, in the mother bud, in October at the moment you plant it, you see that these are the positions in the, in the scales, the A bud, the H bud, the most outer one, and you see that actually the one that is the most close to the shoot apical meristem, that is the smallest and the one which is outside is the biggest, so it more or less resembles the apical dominance what you normally see, the bud, the axillary bud that is the, the most close to the central bud, that is the most dormant. But if you look then over time, you see that the A bud, which is the smallest in the beginning, is directly catching up growth and becoming the biggest ones. Whereas the C and the D bud, which are quite big already at the, mo at the beginning, they stay small and they stay small until the end. So they stay a kind of dormant, except for the H bud, the outer one, that is also growing out quite efficiently. So you see, instead of one gradient that you have here, which you could explain maybe by apical dominance, you have two gradients in the final outgrowth of daughter bulbs. Well, one very simple reason, reasoning could be that it's a matter of sink source and uh, resources. Because the A bud that is close to the central stem where you have um, uh, the mother bulb flowering, so a lot of photosynthesis ongoing, and also the H bud gives often a shoot above the ground, which can also produce. So you have two positions where you have resources. So we said, well, maybe it's sink source, and to study that, we decided to look to the A bud and the D bud, so we cut it from the bulbs in December, 
And what we did is we took those buds and we were placing them in vitro to see if we then apply sucrose. Is it a zinc source thing? Can then the D, D bud grow as fast as the A bud? Well, one thing that we notice is that if we don't give them any sucrose, all of them, of course, there is respiration. They reduce, um, they reduce in their uh, dry weight. And the D bud is even, that is that small, it's even dying. Uh, so that's, it cannot stand that. But if you put them on 6% sucrose, well, our idea was they will all grow with the same capacity because then there are sufficient resources. But the A bud is nicely growing, but still the D bud, it stays alive, but it's not growing at all. So definitely it's not only a matter of seeing source that is determining which bud is outgrowing, there must be something else. Well, then we thought maybe it's the connection with the vasculature and that the D bud is just isolated from the rest and not nicely connected to the source. But that, here we see staining of the vasculature in the A bud, in the C bud and in the D bud. So the pinkish color is the vasculature. And of course there is a bigger vasculature in this big A bud than in the smaller C and D bud, but also the smaller C and D bud you see it's quite nice vascular connection. So it seems not to be that they are um, isolated from the rest of the, of the plant. Well then, what is then the cause of this, um, this block? And uh, then again, um, well, I'm, I'm an Arabidopsis person and I thought, what, what can it be? And then I thought of maybe I should look, what is the knowledge on, on outgrowth of axillary meristems in, in other species like Arabidopsis? And it's good to realize that a tulip bulb is actually a compact, compacted plant, underground plant. So the basal plate is the same as the stem. The scales are a kind of modified leaves, also transcriptomically, they look like petioles of uh, leaves. And then the daughter bulbs which grow here inside are actually axillary meristems. And we know very well what are the genes repressing axillary meristem outgrowth from species like maize and teosinte, and also Arabidopsis. You have the gene branched one, which is a very conserved repressor of axillary meristem outgrowth. So that, that made us think, well, maybe there is also a tulip branched one that is repressing these meristems from outgrowth. So we looked in that. So we had this uh, buds nine days after uh, culture, the A bud growing very well on 6% sucrose, the D bud not. And what we did is we checked the expression. We isolated based on our database, the branched one from tulip. And we see very nicely that in the D bud, there is a high expression of branched one, whereas in the A bud, it's not. Over time it's going down, but it never reaches the low level that the ABUD has. So it seems that branch one is somehow repressing outgrowth of this inner buds. Well, to get some more confirmation of that, we decided to look in um, so-called spring pate tulips. That are tulips there where, in contrast to normal tulips, where the outgrowth of the axillary buds is more or less similar. So somehow these tulips lose that capacity of, of differentiating in outgrowth, all the bulbs grow out with the same speed. And if branch one is the repressor, it should mean that there is no branch one repression in all these buds. And this is triggered, for example, by ethylene or particular temperature treatments. You can trigger this uh, spring pate behavior. Well, we look to branch one expression and what you see very nicely in the normal situation, it's you get a curve when you compare A, B, C, D, H buds, which is opposite to the growth curve. But in the spring pate, you see there's maybe a little bit more expression in C and B, but you see very nice that actually branch one is almost completely off, explaining why then all the bulbs can grow out with an equal speed. So to conclude this part, daughter bulb outgrowth is not solely a matter of zinc source relationships and, and carbon distribution. There's a molecular pathway acting on top of that and genes like branch one, they seem to be key players in dormancy control. And low temperatures and cytokines, I didn't show that, but we have done experiments on that they can repress branch one expression and in that way give, give outgrowth of, of axillary buds. So uh, a few less slides on, because this is outgrowth of meristems, if I'm allowed to. Um, you have also the initiation of meristems and um, we are also interested in that. And that, then Lily comes in because tulip, um, besides that it is, um, that you have these this bulbs that are not outgrowing, that are dormant, it also produces only a very few um, axillary meristems and also when you bring it in culture it's very difficult to get new axillary meristems initiated and to get regeneration. In contrast, lily, when you take a lily scale and uh, you make a cutting of that, when you put it just uh, on, on, in a moisture condition, you don't have to add any hormone or whatever, in a very short period you get all kind of small nice daughter bulbs on the adaxial side of the, of the bulb scale. 
So we were wondering uh, what is happening there and is really there maybe a nice model to study the initiation of, of regeneration in bulbous species. And here you see that in only 10 days, so this is one of those uh, scale explants and we keep it uh, on, on just on a wetted filter paper and already within 10 days you see the first swelling of the, the adaxial bottom side where the wound was and shortly after you see a very nice meristem appearing. And then when you follow that up in time, in, in a relative short time after that uh, appearing of that meristem, you see that a normal, very nice meristem with two scales is forming and you get this nice small bulb that's formed. So a very nice experimental system to study initiation of, of meristems in completely differentiated material because the scale is a modified leaf, completely differentiated tissue. So the very first thing that we asked is uh, how can this very differentiated cells, and here you see a cross-section uh, of that uh, region, so on the adaxial side, so directly after the cut, and here the nuclei are, are stained by, uh, by DAP, and you see a lot of black that is all starch. So these are huge cells with a lot of starch in that, and within 10 days they can somehow activate again and, and reprogram and, and give cell division. So we looked with uh, BRDU, a cell cycle marker, which is um, marking the, the DNA synthesis. What is happening? And then you see very nicely already one day after the cut, you see first nuclei lighting up. And already three days after the cut, well, it looked like it's a Christmas tree or a star, you see that there are many cells here reprogramming and able to uh, start dividing. And as you can also nicely see from this cross section, this is the abaxial side, this is the adaxial side. On the abaxial side, you see very few small cells, but here on the adaxial side, you see a lot of cells that lose the starch, uh, which you see here in these big cells small cells that start asymmetric division under the epidermal cell. The epidermal cell itself, at a certain moment, what it does, it, it breaks, and from below you get a meristem formed. So very fast, in 10 days' time, it is able to reprogram and give this kind of bulb, which is breaking through the meristem, and you get an organized meristem formed. Well, a very simple question we had then um, from Arabidopsis is known that this kind of meristems, they originate not from every cell, but are often so-called pericycle cells. There are the cells close to the, to the vascular bundle that can regenerate, and not every cell has this capacity. So we were also asking, it, it comes from the inside, is it maybe also pericycle-like cells in Lily? So we did a very simple experiment where we cut explants because it's, it's a monocot, so the vasculature is nicely linear organized. So we took explants without vasculature and explants with vasculature, and we checked, is the difference in regeneration capacity? Well, apparently it's not. You see regeneration in both cases, so it seems not to depend on the vasculature. And also when you look in time, so the different regeneration stages, you see that both uh, type of explants, they regenerate with the same speed. So then, of course, the, the, the question comes, what is then uh, triggering this de novo bulbous regeneration in, in, in tulips? And can this knowledge then be transferred to recalcitrant crops such as tulip? So I will not go in detail in that. What we did is again, uh, we did a, an, an RNA-seq and we took a good and a bad regenerating um, lily and we also made explants from the bottom side of the scale and the top side of the scale because the more apical part is doing less good in regeneration than the basal part. So we had four different situations which we could compare with each other. And here you see more or less how, how that is happening. So this is in days. Um, the very fast regenerating one already at six, seven days, we see this bud coming. Um, and then you see the, the most poor one. So the, the top of the poor regenerating one, we see them only after 18 days and much less in number. So we had a very nice differential system to do RNA seq on. Well, that's what we did. And here you see just a plot of, of expression. So we did a so-called self-organizing map approach. And then you can very see that there are already after one day of culture, a lot of genes um, starting to especially in the, in the good regenerating one to, to be activated. And they are response to oxidative stress, response to wounding. And very shortly after, you see already genes, meristem genes, anatomic structural development, post-embryonic development activated. And one example of that is, is STM, that's the gene in Arabidopsis, which is marking the shoot apical meristem. And you see very nicely in the good basal, it's coming up. At one day, you see it already, and already after three, five days, it's peaking, and it's maximum level. Whereas in the poor regenerating one, uh, you see it's coming up also a little bit, but when you compare it to the good basal, uh, it's, it's, it's coming up a little bit, but then it stays there and not able to really boost this regeneration. 
so we also looked at cell cycle genes, and um, I cannot go into detail more now, but we have the idea that there is a kind of wounding response that's also well known, uh, probably a reactive oxygen species. They trigger de-differentiation, and already within one day, that we've also seen from the cell cycle marker, you get cyclins activated and genes like STM that organize the meristem activated, leading to cell division and leading already 10 days later to an organized meristem. Still, it's the question, what is that initial activating signal? And what we realized is that there are, although the epidermis seems not to be involved, there are a few epidermal genes very nicely popping up really early in the, in the RNA-seq. So that triggered us to do an experiment like this. So normally, you always see them only on the adaxial side, not on the abaxial side. And we said, what will happen if you remove um, either the adaxial side or the abaxial side? So if you remove the adaxial side, the funny thing is that you get here on the corners you get regeneration. So the regeneration on the adaxial side is completely gone. If you remove the abaxial side, nothing is happening. You get good regeneration. If you remove both, you get no re regeneration at all. So there seems to be a kind of trigger from the epidermis to the underground layers telling you have to start regenerating. And we are currently trying to identify what is this triggering signal. With that, I will um, stop and just mention, um, I want to mention the two people who did actually all this work. That is uh, Melissa, she finished her uh, PhD uh, thesis. She worked all the flowering time research. And we have Natalia who did all this propagation work in Lily and in, uh, in Tulip. And at this moment, uh, we have a new um, project ongoing with Stimuflori and again, the KAVB. And there we study, uh, especially life cycle shortening. And we do that uh, together with Utrecht University. They also have a PhD student. And it's partly um, um, supported by Duman Orange, the ornamental breeding uh, company. And with that, I'd like to end by also mentioning all the, oh, all the other people uh, who were involved. So uh, this was all done within the plant physiology uh, department. And here you see the plant physiology people, where I was one day in a week, but Melissa and Natalia were continuously there, actually in the Wageningen Seed Lab uh, group. Uh, Harm Neven and Eduard Severin are the bioinformaticians who did all the, the great work on this de novo RNA-seq uh, assembly. Roland Num and Jeroen van Arkel are um, metabolomics uh, people, so they did this metabolomic uh, research from us. And Alex van Silvout and Paul Ahrens from the plant breeding department, they helped us out in um, growing the tulips because we, I had no experience at all with tulips. I was an Arabidopsis person. And finally, Michelle Sakai, with her, we did work on the FT family. Thanks for your attention and sorry for going over time. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.